When it comes to make that music pop, make you give it all it's got, I'm right here to tell you, mister, no one can like the drama man. Welcome to uh, another episode of Foreign Correspondence Deeper into Hitchcock podcast. My name is Michał Leszczyk and I'm joined as always by my co-host Sebastian Smoliński. Hello. And uh, we are continuing with our series of episodes um, devoted to discussion of Hitchcock, of Alfred Hitchcock's filmography, film by film. This is the episode number 20, and we will be talking about a film called Young and Innocent, um, released in November 1937. We have a wonderful guest today, a special guest who will be discussing the film with us, and uh, it's Alexander Roman. Hello, Alex. Hi there. <laughs> Very nice to see you and very nice to have you on the podcast. Um, Alex is a film critic uh, and also theater critic uh, based in, currently based in Łódź, originally from the UK. Uh, he is writing for Sight and Sound, uh, programming for BFI and uh, doing a lot of film related, uh, film -related uh, publishing. Um, and today we have a film that for me at least was a very, very pleasurable rediscovery. I have seen it only once, more than 20 years ago, and uh, I didn't remember it as anything particularly fine. I just remember it was one of those Hitchcock thrillers, you know, one of those films that are a bit like uh, 39 Steps. But now revisiting it at you know very lean 79 minutes uh, young and innocent is actually a pleasure it's a very beautifully crafted film and i will just open the discussion by stating the obvious and stating what has been stated many times before that this is one of the uh, hitchcock thrillers of the so-called classical british era uh, it belongs to the same group with uh, films like uh, 39 steps the man who knew too much uh, secret agent sabotage the so-called thriller sextet and uh, let's start uh, exactly at this point uh, how do you like it and how do you enjoy the story of again falsely accused man on the run meeting a mysterious young woman and forming a couple in the process because that seems to be the template so maybe let's start with our guest alex how was uh, revisiting young and innocent for you it was a pleasure actually you know i think i've always had an affection for this film um, possibly because of the slightly accidental way I first discovered it, which was through this uh, very cheap DVD uh, version, uh, which included Young and Innocent, um, the original Man Who Knew Too Much, and not another Hitchcock film, as you would expect, but a Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes film. So it was a very cheap, you know, thrown together, cobbled together um, collection of, of films I picked up for a pound. So it tells you just how cheap it was. And I think the reason I wanted it was for the Basil Rathbone uh, Sherlock Holmes film, because that was my cinematic crush at this, this time, like early 2000s it would have been. Um, but when I got around to watching Young and Innocent, I was really very, very pleasantly surprised by it. You know, I've, and it's one I've returned to quite a few times over the years. Um, I think, I mean, I don't think the plot is fantastic or even fantastically developed, but it's just the, the little cameos, the set pieces that I think are really, really pleasurable. And I do mm -hmm. quite like the two central performances of Nova Pilbeam and Derek Damane as, as well. Mm -hmm. so. Very young uh, Nora Philby. <laughs> That's right, yes, yes, who of course you remember from The Man Who Knew Too Much, where she played the kidnapped uh, daughter mm -hmm. in, in that. How about you, Sebastian? Yes, I'm... Um, for me, it's, it was also a great re rediscovery. Last time we mentioned, and in our, one of our previous episodes, that discovering these movies is also discovering British culture of the 1930s, reflected, of course, uh, changed a bit, made more filmic and cinematic by Hitchcock, but still there is this feeling of this vernacular British culture, and I think Young and Innocent is one of the best of these uh, of his movies from the 1930s. That's also why I have some questions to Alex about that, about the for example, the reception of this movie uh, in UK when it comes to, like, for, for example, contemporary reception. So are people watching this movie also to surround themselves with British culture mm -hmm. of the so period? Yes. With yes. Is it like in Poland we have mm -hmm. such movies, as you mm -hmm. very well know, mm -hmm. such films, for example, pre-war comedies that we watch to see, oh, that was the Poland of the 1930s. So do you think some of the Hitchcock films, which we mainly think of them as thrillers and we watch them for the author, 
Do you think some of them are uh, kind of um, received that way in UK, more as a cultural yes, items of the they, Euro? They can serve that function and do for for some viewers. I think in the case of this one, not so much because it is very underseen and not and not known. But watching it again, I thought it's quite interesting from a social point of view in the terms of the different locations that we're taken through in the film. You know, from like dos houses to this palatial home where uh, Nova Pilbeam's aunt and uncle live, um, to you know various different different places that we see. So I think it's it has much more interest, social interest, than perhaps people have actually taken into account uh, before. We also um, go down to the coal mine at exactly, one point yes, and we yes. uh, see a farmer who is very, you know, commonsensical in mm-hmm. his approach. And uh, so that's that's wonderful that those details are there. The film was based on a novel by Josephine Tay, which was actually a pen name. Uh, the novel was called A Shilling for Candles, and it's a, it's a part of a longer series of uh, crime novels. I haven't read any of them, uh, but uh, apparently this uh, author was famous for basically those light crime fiction and uh, according at least to Charles Barr who we often quote here um, this wasn't a book that was in any way remarkable did any of you read the Josephine by anything by Josephine Tay I read another book by her called The Franchise Affair and saw a film adaptation and in fact there was a TV adaptation when I was a kid that really scared me it's about these two uh, mother and daughter and whether or not they've kidnapped this younger girl who she mm. claims they have so that was my first sort of knowledge of, of, of her work. But yes, as you say, this is part of this Inspector uh, Grant. Alan Grant. Se- Alan yeah. Grant <laughs> series, yeah. Who, of course, Hitchcock removes from the from the film entirely, right. you know. So, um, yeah, that's, that's very <coughs> interesting. I mean, Charles mm-hmm. Barr, whom, as you mentioned, we refer to him all the time because his English mm-hmm. Hitchcock book is really excellent and a great source for uh, our research as well. But his claim to get back to Hitchcock's roots to, for example, study the relationship between um, British plays of the era and uh, his movies. Um, I found it very difficult kind of really to, to carry on, um, to carry out as a, as a, as a, as a viewer because um, I started reading uh, Shilling for Candles and then I, I, I understood that it's really, I can read it for its for the pleasure of, 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 the, of, of the novel, for the pleasure of kind of going into this fiction, but not not to read it as a kind of source for comparison. It really doesn't make sense. I mean, of course, there are there are people who do that, who study kind of Hitchcock and the sources and make comparisons and point out the differences. But really, what is usually most interesting is how how far Hitchcock departs from these Absolutely. novels. And in this case, I think what I, what I also also try try to suggest uh, by saying that there is this British culture of the 1930s feel is that what he really I think um, saves in his adaptation is the the type of humor, the type of dialogue, which is like kind of qu- quite light, entertaining. You know, that's that's how this novel begins. It begins with a, with a murder, as as the movie does, of course, or, although in a different way. But there is this feeling that it's not really about the the the, the, the thrill itself, the the rather the, the the fun of constructing this narrative, as as the author did it, and the the Hitchcock's fun are are the the key to that. So maybe this is the this is what really um, brings Hitchcock closer to to his compatriots, to, to the writers from from UK. That there is this this feeling of having fun with the narrative, because otherwise, I mean, I think his imagination was quite different from. From that of, yeah, for example, it, Josephine Tay. And in fact, there's quite an interesting article. It's reprinted in Hitchcock on Hitchcock uh, book, which he wrote, I think, in uh, around the time of the film's release. Um, and he's talking about just how irreverent, you know, he is in terms of adaptation. I think he goes as far as to say, you know, I don't even read the book all the way to the end. You know, I just find some aspect that I want to focus on. So he is extremely irreverent. And I think you're right, Sebastian. You know, he manages to preserve something of this this tone, but in terms of the detail, it very much comes from for him his imagination and Charles Bennett and the other mm-hmm. screenwriters, of, of course. This is for me probably the <clears throat> biggest uh, value of Charles Barr's work that he stresses so much the work of Charles Bennett yes. as the sort of architect of those mm-hmm. stories mm-hmm. of the of the structure. Yeah. It's uh, really incredible, uh, you know, the, the way Charles Barr describes very precisely the the plot of Young and Innocent and he shows that there is this perfect symmetry between the first half and the second half and he credits it to Charles Bennett of course Alma Reveal is always in the wings mm-hmm. as the continuity artist uh, but um, for me I guess uh, this film for me when I watched it now and after watching those you know several predecessors I think that 
you can see Hitchcock almost as a machine at this point. He's very adept at making exactly this kind of film. It's almost like his whole career, you know, was pointed to the way in, in, in to this di- into this direction. You know that he can take almost any light crime narrative and turn out this Hitchcock product, of course, with help of by Charles Bennett and others. But this is, you know, this is it. You know, it's his signature product. And uh, when you read, ex- like even in the McGilligan. Uh, biography that you know it was a time when he was already pulled towards the states mm-hmm. charles bennett actually left for the states uh, during working on this film so that's why he left the production uh, hitchcock was working with a new producer ted black uh, and it was very clear he was giving interviews to new york times about how english weather is making it difficult you know to work there mm-hmm. so you know it was very clear that he's like this master storyteller who has his formula, he can do it, he can throw in at least one spectacular shot, like the famous shot, you know, finding the man with the twitch. And uh, it's a small surprise that it only will take him two more films and then he will be off to America. He's on that path and I think Mm -hmm. you can definitely see that with with this one. But do you think that, do you want to say that this movie feels mechanical uh, in a way because of that? Thanks to the performers i think that that nova philby is wonderful uh, she's only 18 in the role we remember her from this striking shot from man who knew too much yes, when, yes. when she was being abducted and the famous you know a little bit fairy taleish uh, shot of her mm-hmm. terrified mm-hmm. Uh, and she's wonderful here and i and this is and of course and um uh, also the 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 lead actor um who's um He's also Derek Donahue, donahue yes. who's wonderful mm-hmm. and and for me at least and i'm an outside observer and i want to ask alex for me they are what I would call quintessentially British, this pair. I don't know exactly why, maybe it's the blazer, maybe it's her, you know, the, the freshness of her humor, yes. but they are totally British for yes, me. Yes, absolutely. In fact, Hitchcock himself made this remark about Nova Pilby, you know, her Englishness was absolutely central, he said, to, to this, you know. And he makes some comment about, oh, you know, let's hope she doesn't go to Hollywood and they don't get her, their hands on her and all of this kind of stuff. So, mm. yeah, I think it is. It, to me, it feels one of the most English of, of these films, you know, mm. almost to the point of parody at, at times, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I completely uh, concur. So do you think that it uh, <laughs> it was, after all, impossible for her to get this... Uh, starring starring role at Rebecca because that was there were some rumors I think that's some right. of them confirmed that mm-hmm. Hitchcock was talking about yeah, it with that's right there's a lot of conflicting stories about that I mean I think she she claimed to uh, McGilligan that Hitchcock definitely did want her and that her agent wasn't sure about entering into such a long contract and things like that but other people said that Hitchcock by that time wasn't sure that she was right. mature enough to do the role and he was interested in auditioning all of these other girls for it so it's it's very difficult to say I think with, with that but um, yeah it's interesting to think to speculate how her career might have gone you know obviously she eventually dropped out of films altogether mm. I don't know if you know that um, a protege of Andy Warhol's kind of became obsessed with her Duncan mm. Hannah and was painting her obsessively and wrote uh, and wrote to her and wanted to you know kind of establish this connection with her you know so she's become this cult this cult figure somehow you know? yeah I, I think uh, I think it's fascinating because uh, wouldn't you say that she because she didn't have any other like famous performances, she she started in, f- in a few interesting movies mm-hmm. afterwards with Forrest Dickinson, for yes, example. Definitely. But you know, her beauty was kind of captured by Hitchcock in Young and Innocent, as he did with so many other actresses. And I think that's why this um, artist, Duncan Hanna, that you mentioned, that's why he, he wanted to kind of re-preserve that. I mean, to kind of allude to to the um, beauty that was there in the 1930s, but when he was making these works, it was not there. It's another kind of British Dorian Gray-like story. Do you think there is something in that that this that Nova Pilbeam, we still remember her as this 18-year-old girl from Young yeah, and Innocent. Exactly that, that she's kind of perfectly preserved in that way, you know. We didn't see any deteriorations, you know. I don't think she made any public appearances at all, you know, after this. So, yeah, well, after the late, I think the late, late 40s was her final film, and then she was on stage, I think, mm. the early 50s. Um, and after that, you know, she's not really seen. So there's something about that, I think, isn't there? Some kind of, you know, unattainable kind of magic about that, mm. you know. And uh, Derek uh, DeMarney, who is 30 years old in the film, he also has this air of, again, youth and innocence, Mm -hmm. because he's not as worldly as Robert Donat. When we meet Robert Donat in 39 Steps, we can definitely sense from the, you know, take one that he... He's been places, you know, he, he, he saw things, yes. you know, he, he, he experienced life. And this, 
this guy no he actually faints yeah. at the shock of false accusation <laughs> that's no right. this yeah. is something that you know um, yes. robert donald wouldn't do no, no he he not. would be more resourceful and uh, and i uh, what i also like this this very brash opening when we get this uh, f- you know marital um, feud you know when the wife and uh, husband are bitterly arguing and it's almost like you know he he throws you hitchcock throws you right into the middle of the scene and you don't know what you are watching you know you know hitchcock at that point so you think oh maybe this is a i don't know a play within a play you know we see we saw him do it you know before in murder other places but then no it, it's a genuine feud and there it ends with a genuine murder but also it's you know this this constant theme of hitchcock of marriage going sour right of uh, the torwald mm-hmm. killing his wife and mm-hmm. and of course uh, well uh, in sabotage we had a, some very dark <laughs> marriage as well uh, so there's and then uh, as as you know bar also points out the film of course ends with the promise of marriage and the question is will this marriage deteriorate to the point which we saw in the very first scene right? yes yes and of course there's another marriage which is Erica's aunt and uncle as well right. isn't right. there with the lovely performance from uh, Basil Radford and Mary Claire who you're going to see soon again in uh, Lady Vanishes mm-hmm. together. Um, so yeah that's an interesting dynamic I think that whole birthday party scene is, is fantastic <laughs> actually you know it really kind of taps into this you know want, being stuck at this social gathering that you want to get, get away from you know and their dynamic and Basil Radford's so kind of genial and Mary Claire I think the way she plays it is so good because she's mm-hmm. suspicious yeah. about the interaction of the of the characters but it's not exactly concern somehow, is it, for Nova Pilbeam's character? It seems yeah. somehow judgmental and puritanical and yeah. unpleasant in a way. Right. You know? yeah. she, she feels that that's the moment where I, where I can uh, really exercise my power right. uh, as, as an aunt, yes. right? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, the aunts in Hitchcock are all yeah. powerful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a formidable collection, and this yes. is definitely one. Um, something I noticed this time on the marriage theme is that small scene just before... Um, Derek Demane's character is going into the courthouse we see a glimpse of this other trial going on yes. which is um, and again about marital conflict isn't it yes. that uh, yes. you know this yes. couple this woman's obviously having problems with her husband and she's wanting the judge to make some kind of uh, pronouncement about him and uh, he does but it's not quite enough for her you know she wants him to do very something so. more so yeah so marriage and the couple I think are again very much interrogated throughout the film it's a piece of dark humor, I would say. Yeah. And um, so, would you agree, like the the, the, the two of you, that uh, there is, of course, something about equality in this partnership in crime, we could say, between Nova Pilbeam and Derek Demarney. Mm-hmm. But um, would you also say that there is there is some kind of, let's say, gender roles reversal, which is really interesting. You mentioned him fainting, right? So uh, he's a very interesting character because he's um, he's very attractive, I would say. I mean, he's and he's sexy in a way. He's boyish. Well, you said it, so we don't have you. Yeah, I mean, you can you can elaborate on that. You can add something, but I think he really is. And I'm, I think I mean, he works on me. Maybe not like Cary Grant, but but in a similar manner. We could also that's maybe why you called him British. That he has this uh, really he's uh, nonchalant. And he's not really oppressive towards women, right? But there is something very seductive about him. But also he has this, let's say, this like f- feminine touches that were certainly feminine in the 1930s, like fainting, like a bit of insecurity and stuff like that. And on the other hand, you know, she's a, she's a really strikingly uh, modern uh, character, you know, with her interest in cars, with her presence, with her being so, uh, out, you know, forward with, with, with other people. So I think there is there is that as well. I mean, that's probably why this movie tastes so good, that it's, it's in a way it's modern, you know, it's like lovers on the run almost, you know, kind of narrative that could be with some ad- adjustment, could be maybe made today with... Uh, more or less, I don't know. Yeah, it does have a surprising freshness in a way, I think, you know. And I think it is something to do with this gender dynamic. I mean, she she kind of has this, I mean, she's a girl guide, right? Mm-hmm. So she kind of has this can-do, you know, spirit, you know. When she mm-hmm. finds him fainting there, she's straight in there, you know, slapping his face and getting him to, to revive, mm-hmm. you know. I love that moment when he does revive and he just kind of rests his his head against mm-hmm. her chest for a moment. It's really, really delicate, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, really lovely. So, and yeah, it's a bit cool. like James Stewart uh, in Rear Window yes. when he wakes up and he sees right. Grace Kelly. Yes, exactly. So, of yes, course, yes. Um, I, f- I think that would be a mistake to call Nova Pilbeam a Hitchcock blonde because yes, she's yeah. not really uh, either, either written was or Was she even portrayed. blonde or was it more ginger? I, I mean, I she, she was called a Hitchcock blonde ah. in an article, mm, yes, right? In a, in yes, a, which yes. was really strange because, yes. like, obviously she was 18. She was a girl and she is really 
photographed and kind of directed as a as a young woman as a girl not as a you know like this well 18 in 1937 i think was considered adult yeah, maybe so, yeah. yeah you're probably you're right but mm. i think like you know she's not a um, she's not in a type of like mm. grace kelly right. Uh, or Ingrid no, Bergman, yes, heroine, no, right? I mean, it's one, she's one of the youngest of Hitchcock. Fresh, yes. She's more, she's closer to uh, the character played by Teresa Wright in Shadow yes, of a Doubt, exactly, right? Yes. So that's why I think it's also yeah. kind of like a film which is young in spirit, uh, which is also quite yes, surprising. exactly, and that's really on the side of its youthful characters. Um, mm. Yeah, I also think it's quite important that she's motherless as well, and that she has the, the dynamic with these four brothers is a lot of fun, you know. And her father is a policeman, yes, right? Exactly, yeah, that's so right. Yes, he's the remnant yes. of the inspector character yeah, from exactly. from the book, that's apparently. Right. Yes. But uh, I, I don't know, I, I cannot really pinpoint that, but for me, this Britishness of hers, I mean, I, I can I cannot really pinpoint it. But when I think of British cinema of 1930s, and of comedies from I don't know like with Will Hay for example there were many young women like that you mm. know in those films like you know she was just a peer you know she was very you know tall bright mm -hmm. uh, she was courageous you know she had this good cheer about her but not in a saccharine way you know like not like a in an American you know way it's, it's just very fresh and open minded and 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 up to anything yeah, and practical minded practical as well mind. you know yes. this kind of girl guide spirit you yes, know yes yes yeah even in skin game you know there mm. were characters like, yes, like right. uh, i i like those characters for me yeah. they sort of the, they became the epitome of you know like the british womanhood yeah. i don't i don't know how how it how it you know survives like, but... like like gracie fields in a way right she might have been a little bit too sweet for my mm -hmm. taste but i mean this like you know like on the brink of adulthood, very resourceful, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. I can do anything. I don't know. I, I associate yeah. it deeply with this with this British type of, I don't know, maybe it's from Shakespeare. I don't yeah, know. I don't. It could be. But yeah, this confidence. And I think Nova Pilm has that. But there's also an arc for her character, I think more mm -hmm. than for Derek Demane's character. Mm -hmm. You know, she kind of becomes more vulnerable as it as it goes on, doesn't she? And a little bit so. I mean, she's kind of you know, can do almost to the point of bossy at the beginning, mm. isn't she? Whereas I think she softens up, you know, through mm. this relationship and her changing perceptions of him and stuff, you know, and I, right, think, right, right. I think that's conveyed quite nicely in the, in the performance. Um, what about the famous shot? Well, how did you, how did you like it this time? Uh, it's, it's quite, I think, remarkably executed. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really remarkable, but I must say that uh, the older I am, you know, <laughs> uh, when I'm rediscovering these movies, I'm these famous Hitchcock shots. They're they come with this, you know, with these footnotes. We all discuss them, and basically, when you open any book, the, this shot is the only thing that's really discussed. Mm. When you know, when it comes to kind of having pleasure in watching this movie, I mean, I have the pleasure in many other places, like performances, uh, and. Uh, uh, supporting, uh, I mean, the cameos and like very ep episodic roles. Mm, I mean, I, I would like to ask Alex about a few things later. But coming back to this shot, I mean, I really admire it. But I think it's kind of um, it doesn't really connect to the rest of the movie. I mean, the it's great and it's like like a climax. So I understand why it's there at this at this moment, like ten minutes before the ending. But the, the the whole film is so like unpretentious, also stil stylistically, mm -hmm. maybe except for this uh, very bizarre like Charles Bar called it Toy Town. You know, there are like these few mm -hmm. shots that are so mm -hmm. obviously mini miniatures. But not only objects are miniatures, but the people, like the the, the, the two characters, they are also they ha they are like dolls, and you can kind of see that, and it's really sweet, and it reminds you it reminds you we are in uh, UK, not Hollywood. You know, there are different budgets, different kind of uh, filmmaking, and it really strikes me now as this as this kind of visual it's a bit jarring but it's also very sweet but so so what i'm trying to say is that the, the shot is really great but um i think that like the, the heart of this movie is you know, in mm. some mm -hmm. some place else yeah i think you're right and i think you're exactly right to say it comes with footnotes and it comes with a certain amount of baggage does an anticipation mm. of that moment and and the, the yeah. stories that you know he had two days to rehearse that that's right to yes. hold two days to yes. do this one shot <laughs> but i have to say that the twitch itself is performed very well by the actor <laughs> i'm forgetting his name right now but I, I could imagine the whole pressure that he felt you know <laughs> yes, <laughs> when he was sitting yes. there and, and he learned to drum apparently as to well. drum yeah. right and yeah. of course there's the culturally problematic element of blackface in the scene as well which i think also renders it mm. uh, uh, more difficult today to discuss yeah. but uh, but it also shows hitchcock i think quite faithfully i guess recreating this sort of nightclub milieu which by the way 
what I find really interesting is not really the milieu of our characters. Mm. It's not like they are going to nightclub every night, you know. Yes. They are not the urbanite. They are not Nick and Nora. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. it's it's just you know they. This is where it led them, you know, mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. fancy club, and uh, and this is why they are here. But it's not like you know, and 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 I don't know if it's true, but uh, I I can sense it that in Hitchcock you have always this a little bit of irony. Uh, directed at like you know higher culture you know that his world is the music hall of 39 steps you know yeah. this is his world and you know the royal albert hall is not really his world i, I think mm-hmm. and here also i think that you know this jazz club i don't know if it's his world or not but probably he would spend his time in a different way i i, I found the interesting anecdote that you know when they were working on the script in the mountains of switzerland skiing everybody was <laughs> everybody was uh, skiing nice. and he was just putting on his ski suit and sitting down on the porch and drinking coffee mm-hmm. so you know, i, I yes. like this yeah. Yeah, yeah. and reading a book yes yeah. and that's part of the function of a character we haven't discussed which is old will right, right. played by edward, right. edward rigby gives a wonderful performance as this you know tramp who's brought into this story and then brought mm-hmm. in in this part into this grand hotel mm-hmm. scene it reminded me a bit of number 17 again you know yeah. this helpful hobo character you yes, know, yes, who, yes, who comes in. Um, well, he will reappear in many Hitchcock films. Yeah, in Trouble yeah. with Harry, yeah, you know, there's this, exactly. you know, sort of like a, a like a Cockney character, you know. Yeah, but uh, that's very interesting what you said about this, um, his resentment towards this higher culture. And I think you can see that in the way he always has to disrupt these high class mm-hmm. performances, right? I mean, also including, for example, auction scene in North by Northwest, mm-hmm. right? It's also another part of like high high art circles and he has to disrupt it and and here i mean jazz was not probably like it's not a high bro probably but this type is of music. a high bro club in the grand yes, hotel, yes, right? yes. And that's in a grand hotel face, right? mm. and but but also like i think we, we should kind of discuss this at least uh, briefly the blackface uh, i mean that because in many american movies for example you really feel that uh, black blackface has this you know the whole history of minstrelsy of mm-hmm. these representations and i wonder in co- the context of uh, UK culture I mean it's almost like it's it doesn't really matter I mean uh, for the plot certainly doesn't matter I mean it's it doesn't matter that they're in the blackface otherwise than you know um, it's one of it's p- p- part of his uh, camouflage mm-hmm. yes scene, exactly right? and so, this scene this theme of disguise which we yes. get throughout the film so how would you I'm not sure I think it's quite interesting when I'm watching it again the band leader is an American isn't he did mm. you notice this? So again, I think it's another this sort of gesturing yeah. towards America. Right, you know? right, 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 right. Um, the song apparently was co-written by Sammy Lerner, this yes. uh, drummer man song. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I would see that sequence, and of course, it's problematic now. But the film is concerned with disguise, and you know, Derek mm. Demarnay becomes a hobo. Old Will dresses mm. in you know the posh clothes of the you know someone right. who would attend this. So I think it's very much within that that framework. Mm. Right, and, and you would say the, the borrowing from U.S. Now. culture is like the, the the most important thing. Here, I would right? say so. Yeah, I fascination. Think, yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. I, mm-hmm. I think so. Well, the thing is also that the title was mm-hmm. changed, right? Because it was supposed to be the girl was young, and then they went to young and innocent. The novel was, of course, called The Shilling for for Candles, and uh, well, this is importantly the last British collaboration between Hitchcock and Bennett. Uh, I, I would say a wonderful series of films that they, you know they made together, and uh, Hitchcock is just about to make his um, one last great British film, which will be um, the last the Lady Vanishes, which we'll discuss next time. But this will be with a different set, with a different set of writers. But uh, to conclude the episode, I wanted to ask you how do you feel in general about the whole formula of the Hitchcock thriller that uh, he developed and perfected in those years, you know, just somewhere in between number 17 and this film. As you were watching this film again, do you feel this formula is still fresh? Would it work today? Is that Would it, you know, be as successful today? Or is it something that is quite quaint? You know, it belongs to the past of the of the movies. What, what was your... Because this is a perfect realization of this formula. Yes, right? yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, th- I think, unfortunately, in some ways it does belong to the past. I would like to see some more British yeah. films with this kind of lightness of touch yeah. and, you know, um, sort of engaging banter and stuff like that. It's, oh. it's kind of lost now. Um, but I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I think it's it's great to see them as a, as a series. You know, and Michal mentioned that Hitchcock was... Uh, working under stress at the time and you can really see that i also think it's interesting that we have 
this par- particular type of cameo in this film, Hitchcock's cameo. I mean, in this film, he has this small camera. He's this, I don't know, he's this journalist who doesn't know what to do, actually, and he's making these strange faces. And McGilligan also mentions that he, it was one of these periods when he really became even heavier. Uh, so you can also see kind of the stress uh, being visible in, on, on this physical level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, you know, this, uh, so I think they are really part of a series of, of this Hitchcock's run. And what we do nowadays, of course, we, we often, you know, separate them from the from the context because that's the way, you know, that's, not, not, that's the only way we can actually kind of watch some of them. But like watched one by one, you can see, really, you can really see as Michal mentioned that they are part of one formula and also that they really complement each other in, 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 in funny ways. And I would say nowadays we can watch them not for the, you know, for the thrills or not only for the spectacular set pieces, which, you know, we, ha- we have better now, we could say. We can, of course, observe Hitchcock's uh, early master masterpieces, but also I would say that what for me is the most valuable thing re- uh, nowadays is the... the, the, um, the the surroundings, the, the 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 small details. I mean, I'm really watching these British films. I have this impression that he was really a master of the social detail. Of course, in his U.S. films, yeah, and that's one of one of my questions. And so, in, in his U.S. films, he starts to put that in his movies. And of course, in the 1950s, we can feel that. We can feel that Rear Window, in a way, is very I don't know American, but also it's so universal that you know, for example, Francois Truffaut can claim it as his movie, as movie about movies, stuff like that. I don't think there is some level of universality in his British films, but I also think they are very, like, very deeply into that culture. That's a quality that he never, I think, managed to regain. No, I think you're right. They are so very particular, and you just feel that they come out of this immersion in the the world of Britishness, you know. Um, Something he said about the the homeless aspect of the film, the homeless character, Mm. was that he wanted to actually do research, you know. He was planning, and maybe did, research, and to even go to such a shelter Mm. himself, you know. Mm. But he said, I probably wouldn't be able to disguise myself. Mm. I look too well-fed, you know, to, to to be a homeless person. But I think that kind of detail is a particular pleasure of these mm. these films, mm. you know, something really, yeah. really enjoyable mm. about that. You know? uh. we, we spoke about the fact that he wasn't really at home in this, like, posh places. And on the other hand, you know, in all these scenes in Young and Innocent, and there are so many of them, like with the with the um, homeless shelter and the um, this bar or the, the inn that they are in, you, you can really feel this ple- pleasure that he really enjoys staging these simple folks and that he's really enjoying this this culture. So that's that's why maybe some of his American movies feel more isolated. Like for example, Vertigo is a, it's it's a masterpiece, but it's a you know characters are very isolated in a way, right from the from the larger world, and that's not something that is there. No, I, yeah, I think you're right. There's a sense of detachment. I think there isn't there which in the British films you do feel like he's immersed in, in that world and that it comes from observation you know it, it does feel like like a pub is never you know far off you know like he, <laughs> that he could actually exactly. enjoy a pint yes. you know after after shooting a film in American films he was already you know eating meals at his California mansion <laughs> yeah. and that's that definitely changed his perception uh, one last question to Alex um, you know you you write for sight and sound you're uh, working for BFI so of course you know Alfred Hitchcock is you know, one of the most celebrated British filmmakers of all time and very much part of British cultural heritage. How do you feel uh, young film critics writing right now in the UK, how do they feel about him? Is it still like, you know, the sort of, you know, necessary canon to know Hitchcock films, to, you know, to be able to discuss them? Or is he a master of the past, one of many who, you know, people simply learn about but mm-hmm. uh, how mm-hmm. how in other words how central he is for british film culture at I the th- moment yeah i think he is still central i mean look at the number one film on the sight and sound you know best films mm-hmm. of all time list you know for one i think now of course there is the the whole tendency to pick out problematic elements mm-hmm. in uh, in in past work which takes up a lot of critical space so i think that's that's something that but does it apply to his British films actually um, is there a single story about his British period that not that I'm aware of no no not that I'm aware of and I'm sure you know for some the blackface section here would mm-hmm. be highly problematic mm-hmm. and would, you know any heirs any filmmakers now British filmmakers that you feel like are heirs to I don't know Peter Strickland or you? Yeah, strict. Well, I would, I would almost make a case for Guy Ritchie. In fact, oh, you know, oh, having oh. just very much enjoyed The Gentleman, you know, uh-huh. that does have kind of this you know, subversive humor and you know, intricate plotting and yeah. um, enjoyment of Englishness. Yeah. And you know, so I would make a case for him. But yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, for the more perverse side, yeah, you could definitely look at someone like Peter Strickland. Yeah. 
And what about the 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 artists obsessed with you know the, the filmmaking itself and images and uh, the, the the visual uh, stuff? Of course, Peter Strickland is one of them. But mm -hmm. like this, so would you say there are some links between like Hitchcock and Jonathan Glazer on this deeper level, like structural? Oh, well, he needs to make more films. <laughs> because, yeah, you know, exactly. then we'll say you know they'll yes. be able to know. You know, I think Hitchcock is kind of unavoidable, don't mm -hmm. you? You know, he's so deeply in the DNA of, mm -hmm. of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. I think there are probably few who haven't been touched by him in, mm -hmm. in some way. Um, well, I, I sincerely hope there won't be a Netflix TV series, Young Hitchcock or something, you know, where we, <laughs> oh, we submitted yeah. to, you know, the reinterpretation of the whole process. And mm -hmm. well, anyhow, that's my, you know, grievances talking. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it was absolutely. a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. So and especially on this 20th uh, episode. So, you know, we are slowly closing the British chapter so i really we are really hoping that you will revisit us um, somewhere in the american journey yeah, i would love to yeah it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys and uh, to share ideas thank you so much um so we'll be wrapping up this episode and uh, please follow us on facebook foreign correspondence deeper into hitchcock uh, and uh, share us share the episodes if you like them please also rate us on itunes and uh, we will be joining you uh, soon <laughs> and we'll be talking about uh, the Lady Vanishes, a uh, wonderful film, a really wonderful One film. Right? One of my favorites. <laughs> I think we should just say to our listeners that um, why Alex is you know, here today, it's because you actually chose this film, right? I did. So yeah, I, I like an underdog. You know, I feel this film is, is not <laughs> as celebrated as it could be. And I hope you know, we'll encourage people to either revisit it or, uh, or to watch it for the first time. And we will have a wonderful guest then as well, but we will keep uh, her a secret. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this was the 20th episode of Foreign Correspondence. Deeper into Hitchcock. <laughs>